This is Mrs. Ober, and this is a PowerPoint with some audio um, to talk about the different models of the atom as they progress historically. And this is Dalton's model of the atom, which um, Dalton's model existed in the early 1800s. And at that point in time, um, Dalton thought that the atom was just a uniformly dense neutral sphere and no charge, and that was pretty, uh, pretty simplistic, but that was the model of the atom at that time. Dalton's uh, assumptions about his model uh, were, one, that matter is composed of atoms, two, um, all atoms of a given element are identical, atoms of different elements are different, atoms cannot be broken down or created, atoms can, can combine with other elements in small whole number ratios. In chemical reactions, atoms are combined to form compounds. Compounds are separated or rearranged. This is a picture of a cathode ray tube. And a cathode ray tube was a, a piece of equipment that uh, was experimented with during the uh, latter part of the 1800s. And Crookes was one of the scientists who did a lot of experimentation with that. And one of the questions he raised was whether or not the beam uh, that was being projected by the cathode tube was a beam of light or a beam of particles. And Crookes went ahead and placed some magnetic plates on either side of the tube and he noticed that the beam was deflected. And upon that he then concluded that the beam was a beam of particles and not a beam of light. J.J. Thompson uh, picked up where Crookes had uh, kind of left off and he did also did work with cathode ray tubes. And Thompson was one who um, placed a positively charged plate and a negatively charged plate on either side of the cathode ray tube. And since we now knew that the beam was a beam of particles, um, Thompson wanted to know what the particles were in terms of charge. Well, the particles were deflected towards the positive plate, so from that, Thompson concluded that the particles were negatively charged particles. So this is a picture of uh, what Thompson he had done with the cathode ray tube. He, um, he actually put those positively charged and negatively charged plates on either side of the, of the cathode ray. And again, noticing here that the beam was deflected towards the positive plate, he concluded that these particles were neg negatively charged particles, and he is credited with discovering the electron. This is another picture of a cathode ray tube, and in this particular picture, the positively charged plate is on the bottom of the cathode ray tube, but notice also that the beam is deflected towards the positively charged plate. So uh, we didn't know at that time that these were negatively charged particles, um, which we call electrons. J.J. Thompson is credited with, uh, with actually discovering the electron or I guess you could say he verified the existence of it. Millikan was one who did um, the oil drop experiment with the electrons, and he is the one who discovered the charge of the electron and the mass of the electron. The experiment that Millikan did is also noted in your text and in the um, other videos that are linked to the website, to our Honors Chem headline site. After Thompson discovered the electron, Dalton's uh, uniformly dense sphere model, the atom, was no longer correct. So that one was put aside, and a new model, the atom, was, was put into effect, and that was Thompson's plum pudding model. And what Thompson described the atom is, as was a, um, some pudding, um, and all the pudding was a positively charged part of the atom, and the plums or the raisins in the pudding were the uh, negatively charged um, at were the negatively charged electrons. Excuse me. So this was a model of the atom um, towards the end of the 1800s um, after Thompson had discovered the electron. This is another picture of um, Thompson's plum pudding model. Again, the electrons are represented by the plums or the raisins in the pudding, and the rest of the pudding is all the positively charged part of the atom. This is a picture of J.J. Thompson and Rutherford. Uh, Rutherford, we're going to find out in a minute, is the uh, scientist who actually did the gold foil experiment 
to actually identify the nucleus. J.J. Uh, Thompson and Rutherford, their hypothesis was that they were trying to determine um, how much of the atom uh, was positively charged and where was this positive uh, charged part of the atom. And so they took very fast moving alpha particles, which are really helium nuclei, and they bombarded it at gold um, atoms that were in gold foil. And so if it went straight through, that meant that um, they were not, you know, coming across or hitting any of the um, positively charged particles in the atom. And um, if they did, then they felt like they should be deflected. This is another picture of Rutherford. Um, and this is in the early 1900s. Uh, this is about when Rutherford did his gold foil experiment. This is a diagram of the setup of Rutherford's gold foil experiment. Uh, he had a radioactive source uh, which generated alpha particles, which are just very fast moving helium nuclei. And these particles were aimed at gold foil, which just consisted of gold atoms. And surrounding the foil was a screen, a fluorescent screen that would detect all the alpha particles as they hit it. And so he did this experiment repeatedly to determine you know, what happened to these alpha particles. Were they deflected? Did they come straight back to the source? Or were they uh, just going straight through the gold foil? This is a picture showing the path of the alpha particles in the gold foil experiment. As you can see, most of the alpha particles, which are lined up vertically on the left, went straight through the gold foil. Um, they were not bent or deflected in any way. Um, there were a few that were deflected and some actually were deflected straight back. And those that were deflected back pretty much hit the nucleus head on. Those that were deflected a, a small amount uh, kind of scraped the side of the nucleus. So as you can see from his repeated experiments, most of the alpha particles went straight through the gold foil. This is another picture of the results of Rutherford's gold foil experiment. And again, we see that most of the alpha particles went straight through. They're pretty much in a straight line. Um, we see occasionally those that were deflected off the side. And then even less so, we see some that were deflected back to the source. So after Rutherford's gold foil experiment, he concluded that the nucleus contains most of the mass and all the positive charge of an atom. Uh, we know now that the mass number is equal to the number of protons and neutrons, those particles that are concentrated in the very dense nucleus, and that we also know that the atomic number is the number of protons. So once Rutherford had made this discovery, Thompson's model of the atom, the plum pudding model, was no longer accurate. So that one had to be uh, kind of put by the wayside, and now we have a new model of the atom, and it's referred to as a nuclear model, where we know that all the positive charge and most of the mass is in this very dense, concentrated center. And, and now all we know is that the electrons are out there somewhere beyond the nucleus. Um, one of the things that um, Rutherford, that came out of Rutherford's experiment was that all atoms of the same element are not alike. Um, we can have what we call isotopes. So that that particular part of it uh, disproved Dalton's part of his theory that said all atoms of the same element are exactly alike. And here we can see um, isotopes of the same element. Um, they happen to be carbon isotopes. So being carbon, they all have six protons, which is the atomic number carbon that identifies it as being a carbon atom. But some of them have six neutrons, some have seven neutrons, and some have eight neutrons. Uh, the most abundant um, isotope is the one that has six neutrons, the one whose mass number is 12. And we would know that because the average atomic mass of carbon uh, is closest to um, that mass number of 12. Uh, this picture uh, shows us much what, of what we talked about, about in Chapter 2 with the relative abundances of different isotopes. Um, again, because carbon-12 um, it's the most abundant one. The average mass of carbon is very close to the mass of that particular isotope. There is a very small amount of carbon-13 and even smaller amount a trace of carbon-14. Uh, this is a view of the current quantum mechanical model of the atom. 
Uh, we know again that because of Rutherford that we have a nucleus that is a very small, dense, concentrated center that contains most of the mass and all the positive charge. And uh, the electrons are out there in, in orbitals, which are regions where we're likely going to find them. Um, we cannot pinpoint their exact location at any given time, but we can define areas where we're likely going to find them. Uh, this again, we know that the atomic number, the number of protons of a given element, relates to its position on the periodic table. Um, and again, we know that the electrons are out there somewhere beyond that nucleus. This last slide shows us the five different models of the atom. Uh, very back in the back part of the picture um, is Dalton's model in the early 1800s, the uniformly dense sphere. Uh, moving upward, we have the Thompson's model right around the turn of the century. Um, his model was the plum pudding model, where we had the negatively charged electrons being represented as the, the plums of the raisins and the pudding, and the pudding itself was the whole rest of the atom that was positively charged. Um, after that, Rutherford's model, which came right around 1911, a little bit thereafter, um, we know that there is the very dense nucleus that contains all of the positive charge and most of the mass, and so that kind of um, nails down that part of the atom, but uh, leaves us quite open as to where the electrons are. Not quite sure about that. Bohr came along right after that, and he was the one that came up with the energy levels that we've talked about, and so we know that these electrons are in energy levels, um, that they're quantized, um, and that's Max Planck's contribution to that. Um, but we weren't quite sure of, of where they, how they were orbiting or whatever. Bohr thought that they were orbiting around the nucleus like um, in a solar system, but we found out later on that that was not correct. And finally, the fifth model, which is similar to Bohr's in some respect, uh, with the dense nucleus in the center and the energy levels, but again, this one has electron clouds. And electron clouds are just areas where we're likely going to find electrons. We talk about probability of finding an electron there, uh, not so much exactly where it is. And so this is just a slide showing the, the development of the five different models of the atom from Dalton in the early 1800s to the current quantum mechanic model, which was developed mid to late 20s, early 30s, um, in what we currently still use today.